Good morning, Hugh. Great to be with you again. Uh, give me your assessment of what has happened in the last 72 hours. Well, I mean, the, I think the big news is that Russia is having a very, very hard time with this military operation. So that's, um, I, I think, a very great thing for the free world to see Ukrainians fighting against this aggressor, to see the javelins working, the, the MLAWs working. I mean, all the right kit is in the field. And, um, you know, we're taking, I think, uh, taking out their armor in that sense. And that was a, a lot of the thrust here. But it also puts Putin in a position where is he prepared to lose this war? And I think the answer to that is, is probably... Uh, you know, it might not be. I mean, so he's going to most likely escalate here, particularly if these talks have just failed. And a lot of people have been asking, why is this happening? Why now? I mean, we've been dealing with Russia, um, you know, taking aggressive actions in, in, in Georgia and in Ukraine. I mean, it's been all over the region. But I think the important thing here to understand is the backing that they have from China. So we cannot fail to understand that this is a Russia-China problem. That's what it's always been. That relationship has been flourishing in the past, um, you know, few years, and you can even go back a decade and see them putting in the right economic pieces and military exercises. So that's what we're dealing with, is a combined challenge in Europe and Asia. A lot of people want to split that and say that we have two independent problems, but they are not independent problems. Russia would not be doing this without Beijing. I saw uh, President Xi described yesterday as being a pro-Russian neutral party, and I just said that that's hilarious. That's a contradiction in terms. But he is leaning into Putin. He is providing aid and assistance. I assume intelligence. There was a leak over the weekend that we asked for his help and he immediately leaked what we asked to the Russians. What is that relationship between Putin and Xi? Well, I think it's one of strategic convenience. I mean, these people are not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a deep sort of trusting relationship so much as one that resembles Mao and Stalin in the early Cold War, where Stalin said to Mao, you go into Korea, you handle this. And if you get kicked in the teeth, I won't lift a finger. That was the quote. Um, so the bottom line was the communists wanted at that time under their uh, proper alliance to open two fronts against the West and split the United States, divide us around the world. I think it's the same thing going on, but it's got a much more significant economic property because a lot of how you're going to deal with the Russia-China problem is, um, you know, we're going to have we're already in economic warfare with Russia, and eventually we're going to have to do things like that to China as well. I mean, they still have an economic ascendancy. Wall Street is still funding it like uh, there's no tomorrow. And we're going to have to start taking measures against China's economy, too. And, and right now we have on display, um, you know, the support of one economy for, for the other. So, so that's what we're dealing with. Uh, Dr. Ward, do you think that the ability to cut off Russia completely will be noticed by China as they consider their moves vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? Well, I think that's what one of the things that they get here is is to watch a test case happen before their eyes. I mean, the kinds of sanctions that the U.S. and our allies are rolling out on Russia are um, sort of state killer type sanctions. I mean, things that really can damage a large economy, um, freezing central bank assets, freezing the assets of major banks, cutting them off from SWIFT, doing things like that are far, far more substantial and significant than export controls or entities list or anything that we've deployed on China already. So China gets to watch the West do economic warfare against a major power. And then, of course, their question is, how significant is that? Does that really stack up against our desires to take Taiwan? Um, so, so, you know, I, th I think that's a very big piece of their calculus. Um, they have much more to lose than Russia did. I mean, Russia's been under sanction for nearly a decade post-Crimea, China in much uh, less of a significant way, and also there are far few multinational corporations that, that consider their future to be in Russia, where in China, that's pretty much the, you know, pretty much every, every major company has is, is got a, a, a big China presence and a big China strategy. So that's why they've all been resistant to the tariffs and the trade war. Um, you know, China has more to lose, and at the same time, they have us more in their grasp when, when it comes to the economic relationship. Jim Shuto of CNN reporting, in an aggressive move, U.S. cuts off Russia's central bank and direct investment from, from U.S. dollar transactions. The steps are meant to prevent Russia from accessing a rainy day fund that Moscow had been expected to rely on during the invasion of Ukraine. Do you think the United States has done half of what it could, three quarters of what it, uh, it could do, or is it at the top level of the sanctions economic division that we can do? Oh, no, I think we can do much, much more. And, uh, you know, the point that you just made about the reserves, I mean, uh, there, there's a, a Chatham House um, financial warfare specialist talking about fortress economics and how Russia and China have both, Russia to a much larger degree, built up um, reserves, the ability to, to withstand Western sanctions. So, so it's not that we just get to do this 
and, and, and have total economic victory. I mean, these guys have been preparing for this, and China's doing that too with the um, stockpiling of semiconductors and the indigenization drives um, you know, on each side. They, they have their ways of countering this. And of course, um, the, the oil price has gone, gone way up, and that's, you know, that's going to give Putin a certain amount of ballast here. Um, so in, in, if we really wanted to sanction their oil and gas exports, for example, that's where the real, um, you know, that's the danger zone for them. But I think the, the actions on the financial system are very important. Now, Dr. Ward, if we do sanction and prohibit the sale of Russian oil, won't they just turn around and sell it to China? Well, there's only so much you can ultimately sell. I mean, yes, it's a commodity and they've locked in contracts with China. Um, but, but you know, we, we are buying it. And most importantly, Europe is buying it. So really to have Europe depend on Russian gas. And, and again, the point that people make is you can't cut that off in the middle of a European winter. So, so there is all of those go into the calculus. I imagine the decision making, the timing that Putin has utilized here to, to make these moves. Um, but what he's done, and let's not forget, um, you know, Vladimir Putin has put Russia on the path towards subservience for China. I mean, he's destroyed his relationships with the West, and he already did that in 2014 with Crimea, but now he's really done that. The whole world understands it. And what future is there for Russia? I mean, there's really, it's going to be um, a, a satrapy of the People's Republic of China, dependent on them for, you know, economic relations of all kinds. Um, and, and, you know, that's a very dangerous place. Yeah, um, well, let's underscore that. There are, Russia is a nation of 144 million people. Uh, China is 10 times as large. China is the economic power. Russia is Saudi Arabia with trees. All they have is oil. And now they're going to be crippled. And what they can only do is then attach themselves to China, right? And I, I, I assume that China will exploit that dependency. Yes. Yes, they will. I mean, they all. How do they do that? Well, first of all, I mean, China is not a good partner to have. This isn't uh, an yeah. alliance, but right. And, and, you know, exactly. I mean, you and I understand that and so do many other people. But this is not an alliance between the United States or Australia or something like that. I mean, this is something where even in Crimea, they priced gouged the Russians on the energy deal in 2014 that came right out of that. When Russia has a lack of options and China's their only options, uh, the Chinese aren't going to support them. They're going to exploit that. And I think we see that already. Um, a lot of people have made I think way too much out of the half-hearted diplomatic support. You know, China is not calling it an invasion, but it's not condemning it. And then they're saying we want parties to come together and make peace. That's just diplomatic speak for the world stage. I mean, that's designed for Davos and, you know, naive politicians. But what they're actually doing is locking in an economic relationship with a military superpower such that that military superpower depends on them. Now, you tell me how big our problem is as the United States. It's gotten much, much bigger. Well, that, that is the bottom line, is that we now have an alliance, a new axis, and that axis is Iran, China, and Russia. What do you make of sitting down what Secretary of State Pompeo said in the last hour? Uh, yesterday, we negotiated on the same side of the table with Russia and China against the Iranians, except we're not negotiating against them. We're just preparing to give stuff away. That's insane. That's Biden administration insanity, Dr. Ward. Well, I, th I think the, those three countries are, are the, the real challengers to the U.S. and in totally different ways. They, they, their you know, shared interests are really just about being anti-American, anti-Western, anti-world order. And I think, the, uh, you know, as, as a speaker of both Russian and Chinese, I mean, you go and read all the Putin essays and speeches and such, and he's got a very, very deep view of grievance, much like Xi Jinping's. It goes back 100 years. He blames the Second World War on Britain and France, on the Munich betrayal. Then it goes all the way through NATO expansion. And, you know, like Xi Jinping, this is an unlimited scope for revisionism and grievance. Um, it's not the same as China's view, but there is an ideology here that basically says, we do not want this order. We did not create this order. Um, and we're going, to, you know, we're going to adjust it by force. Um, Jonathan so Ward, those... you know both regimes. You know both regimes pretty well. Do you think Xi is more precariously uh, perched atop the Chinese elite, or is Putin more precariously perched atop the Russian elite? Well, I think there's a different, you know, in both cases, I think they, they have the support of their military, their intelligence services, their basically coercive functions. Um, but China's coercive functions are much more sophisticated. I mean, the kind of protests that you've seen um, in Moscow and St. Petersburg and across Russia. I mean, I've traveled all over Russia. I mean, it was not, um, you know, it was prior to Crimea um, in 2014, prior to that. So, so a country that did not, um, in, in my experience, have the sort of at a popular level, ex aggressive expansionist ideas. Where in China, I found that was very common. It was all taught by the state to the, to the, the people through the school system and state media. Um, 
but I think it's 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 sort of a different thing here because um, Xi Jinping at the end of the day has um, Chinese uh, military nationalism to back him up. I mean the the kinds of things that are all over the Chinese internet right now supporting the war, um, you know, in, in in Ukraine. I mean, saying that they love Putin. I mean, that was stuff that I heard all throughout my chi time in China. I mean, wow. they call it Putin, 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 Putin fever. They, they loved Putin, particularly after Crimea won in 2014. So, so it's a different. Dr. Of John Ward from Atlas Organization. Keep coming back. That's Dr. Jonathan.